Hello there. My name is Minister Barton Aaron Porter, and today we're going to continue our study of the great book of the Acts of the Apostles with the 23rd chapter. Now, I'm going to be using the good old King James Version of the Bible as I always do. So I encourage you to get your Bibles out and to study along with me. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, we come before you with bowed heads and humble hearts, confessing our sins, Lord, and asking for forgiveness in the name of Yeshua. Wash us and make us clean in his precious blood. We put all our faith and hope and trust in that great sacrifice that he made for us at Calvary, Lord. And we pray right now, Father, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Fill us, Father, for Yeshua's sake, that as we go into your word, the Holy Bible. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray, amen. In our last Bible study, we saw in that 23rd chapter that after the chief captain found out that Paul was a Roman citizen, he started to treat him with a little respect because he was about to have him beaten, you know, you know, to find out what, why the Jews wanted him dead. And uh, Paul used wisdom. Paul said, hey, to the, uh, to the soldier, the centurion, he said, is it lawful for you to beat a Roman citizen who hasn't been condemned? And he ran and told the chief captain. So chief captain showed him a little more respect now because he know he could get in big trouble if Paul made a thing out of it. So now he's having those same Jews, the leaders of those Jews, come down and, and, and brought before Paul to accuse him and, find, and try to find out what's going on. So this is where the story continues. Acts chapter 23, verse 1. It says, and Paul earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day, Paul says to them. Verse 2, And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. So the high priest said, Slap him in his mouth! And they slapped him too. Pop! Verse 3, then Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee. God's going to strike you, thou whited wall, you whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. He was God's going to strike you down because you sitting up there as a judge of the law and you having me smacked in the mouth against the law. Look what happens. Verse 4. And David stood by saying, Revileth Thou, God's high priest. They said, you're talking back to God's high priest? Verse 5, that was verse 4. Then Paul said, I wist not, which means I knew not, brethren. He said, I knew not, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So this is one of the things we have in scripture that proves that Paul's eyesight was never fully restored. And that's what he was referring to when he wrote in that letter in Corinthians about a thorn in his flesh. His eyesight was restored just good enough where he could see to function, but it was never fully restored because God didn't want him to get a big head, you know, to be ego tripping because the Lord took him up to heaven and he heard things that was not lawful for an ordinary human being to heal, I mean to hear. And so that thorn was with him for the rest of his life. That's why when he got to jail and he was writing letters, a lot of times he would have a scribe, like a secretary. He would tell someone else what to write because he had bad eyesight. And if he did write something, the portion he wrote, he wrote in extremely large letters. Okay, So I told you I would back up that statement I made in the last Bible study video with this uh, Bible study video. So this is one of the ways... We know Paul's thorn in the flesh was his eyesight. So he couldn't see that that was the high priest from where he was sitting. He looked like, you know, he was sitting off and he looked like a white wall. That's all he saw. And, he, and that's why he got, he said what he said. God's going to strike you, you white wall, for hitting me, having me hit in the mouth. And they said, you talking to the high priest like that? And then he, he apologized immediately. Let's move on. 
verse 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I, <coughs> excuse me, Paul says, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and the resurrection of the dead. I am called in question. So Paul's using a little wisdom now. He says, we got the Pharisees and the Sadducees in here. And he said, I'm going to use this to my advantage. So he let them know he was a Pharisee. And then he said, um, the reason why he was there was because he was talking about the resurrection of the dead. Verse 7. And when he had, and when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude, that means the crowd, was divided. Verse 8, for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So Paul is pretty sharp dude. He said, I'm going to get these Pharisees on my side because he knew the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection or angels or any kind of spirit. Verse 9, and there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. <laughs> but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So Paul knew what he was doing. <laughs> Verse 10, and when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the, and to bring him into the castle. So he knew that the Pharisees and the Sadducees constantly fought about this. And so he let them know that he was a Pharisee who believed in the resurrection. And, and they immediately, hey, let him go. Cut him loose. Maybe somebody did tell him to do what he's what he doing. Maybe an angel told him, we don't want to fight against God. Same thing Gamaliel said earlier when they were uh, persecuting God's uh, followers. When, you know, when Jesus had them out there preaching, Gamaliel said, hey, you better be careful. You know, because if they truly are men of God and you bother them, you're fighting against God. So, they grabbed him. The Pharisees was trying to set him free. Let him go! Cut him loose! Sadducees had him. No! Bring him over here! So they were stretching him like a rag doll. And the chief captain said, get down there and get him out of there before they rip him in half. They went down there, took him, and took him back to the castle. Verse uh, 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him. Jesus came to him again and said, be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me, as you have bared witness of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. So Christ said, hey, you're not going to die yet. I'm going to send you to Rome. Verse 12. And when it was day, certain of the Jews band together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that we would neither eat nor drink Till they had killed Paul. They said, we're going to get him. Uh, verse 13. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. So they say, we're going to take matters into our own hand. We're going to get, we're going to kill Paul. Okay? Verse 14. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. They came to the chief priests and they would say, look, we will not eat anything until we have killed Paul. Verse 18. Now therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near are ready to kill him. So they say, we need y'all to 
call, go up to the chief captain and say, bring him back one more time. We want to ask a few more questions, get a couple more details. And, he, and when he brings them down, we're going to kill it. All right? Verse 16, that was 15. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. So they didn't know that Paul's sister's son uh, was right there listening to him. He heard everything they said, and that was nobody but the Lord looking out for Paul because he had already told Paul that he was going to send him to Rome. All right, 17. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he has a certain thing to tell him. 18. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who has something to say unto, unto thee. So the soldier did exactly what Paul said. He took his sister's son to the chief captain with this message. 19. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, what is that thou hast to tell me? So he took Paul's sister's son and said, come on, take him by the hand, let's go over here. Now, what do you got to tell me? 20. And he said, the Jews have agreed to desire of thee that thou bringest down a Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. 20, 12, 20, 21. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than 40 men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him and now are ready looking for a promise from thee. So he said, hey, I heard of the conspiracy to get Paul killed. It's 40 men who say they're not going to eat or drink until they killed him. And they got the, the leaders to tell you, they're going to get the leaders to tell you to bring Paul down there again like they want to ask some more questions. And they're, gonna, they're lying in wait. They're going to kill him. So he told them. Um, 22. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him. See thou tell no man that thou hast showed um, these things to me. So he, he told Paul's sister, son, he said, go on. Don't tell nobody what you told me. Go home, boy. 23. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea. And horsemen, three score and 10. Uh, score is 20, so 3 times 20 is 60, plus 10, that's 70. 70 horsemen and spearmen, 200, at the third hour of the night, 24. And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix, the governor. Now, the chief captain is showing Paul the proper respect now that he knows he's a Roman citizen, okay? He's going to make sure he's protected as he gets up there to Felix, the governor, okay? Verse 25 says, and he wrote the letter after this manner. 26. Claudius Lysias, unto the most excellent governor, Felix, Felix sendeth greeting. 27. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Now he's lying. He's telling a lie. He didn't know he was a Roman a citizen at first um, when he rescued him. So he's trying to make himself look good. <laughs> anyway, verse 28, And when I would have known the cause whereof they accused him, I brought him forth into their counsel. 29, Whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. That means shackles. 30, and when it was told me how that the Jews lay, laid wait for the man, I sent straight away to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. 
farewell. So he wrote the letter to Felix, and he sent Paul up there to the governor. He said, and that's that. It's out of my hands now. 31, then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatis. 32, on the morrow, they left the horsemen to go with him and return to the castle. 33, uh, who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle, which is a letter to the governor, presented Paul also before him. So they carried out exactly what the chief captain told them. Took Paul up there, gave the letter to the governor. 34, and when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was. And when he understood that he was of Cilicia, 35, he says, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. So he says, when those Jews who accuse you get up here, then I'm going to hear you. So he sent them over there to Herod's judgment, um, judgment hall to be kept until they got up there. So if this particular Bible study has been a blessing to you, I encourage you to go to paypal.me slash Barton Porter and please make a financial contribution of any amount. Whatever you can afford to give is a tremendous blessing to me in this ministry and you will be helping me to continue to be able to produce these Bible studies and get the true teachings of our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit out. And if you like this particular shirt that I'm wearing, Jesus Christ died for us. I encourage you to go to my online t-shirt store at teespring.com slash store slash Godwear and check out some of the Godwear there. And if you see something that you like, buy it because when you buy any of my Godwear, be it a hoodie, a long sleeve, or a coffee mug, you are getting something that I think you can use to spread the gospel with, but you're also blessing this ministry and my favorite charity, Feed My Starving Children. So, until next time, this is Minister Barton Aaron Porter saying, may the good Lord continue to bless you and keep you all the days of your life. And be sure not to miss the next Bible study when we go into the 24th chapter of this great book of the Acts of the Apostles. God bless you. And goodbye.